I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Oh, Bruce and Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Wrangler. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Bloody Angola, a podcast 142 years in the making. A complete story of America's bloodiest prison. And I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. We always tell them we're going to give them something Some, different, something right? Something different in all aspects of Angola, from the good to the bad, um, from the most horrible to the most uplifting. And I think today, it certainly qualifies as, as probably the most uplifting episode. I would, done. I would definitely agree with that. Uh, I mean, it's it's in totality. Yeah, it, it, it's a really, really you know, for, born out of tragedy is 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 basically a daily miracle. You you got that right, and and so brace yourself because uh, because this story will get you. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I do want to mention before we even get started that the way I met this gentleman was through P2P, which is another podcast that we're, we, uh, Scott Huffman's been on our show. Pen Century Penthouse Show. Yes, yes. And, uh, and met this gentleman through them and was just absolutely blown away by his story. And he's agreed to come on today and kind of tell it and talk about the great things he's doing with his second chance and, so we want to welcome you, uh, Andrew Hundley, to Bloody Angola. Thank you for having me. Andrew, I, I told you just briefly before we started, I, I want the people to know who you are, the good, bad, and indifferent, and, but the world needs more people like you, right? And everybody knows I'm an old homicide detective, and, and you think I'd be a, a – all hard ass on, you know, prison stuff like that. But I'm not. I, I believe in people uh, um, and people's stories. So, if you, if, if tell me where you grew up, and and to just tell you a story, and I'm gonna interrupt you a lot and ask a lot of questions because if I don't, it'll just slip my brain. You know? <laughs> sure. And in, uh, in 1981, I was uh, born. At Opelousas General oh, Hospital. Opelousas got some, some yeah. Billy's boot. Cajun uh, country. Really? Yeah. My, my, uh, my parents lived in Eunice, but the home I of the purple I, peacock. Opelousas had the best local hospital at the time, and right. that's where my mom wanted to deliver me. Grew up, uh, <clears throat> you know, middle, middle son, uh, older uh, sister, younger sister, to loving parents, and, uh, and, and grew up in Eunice, and uh, just sort of had the the normal life of a, a kid from Cajun country. I probably yeah. passed you a couple of times on my way to the Purple Peacock. <laughs> a lot older than you are. So. Well, and I and I can hear even in your voice, you've got that that, that kind of accent. My my wife's family is from Orneville area, so uh, I kind of pick up a little bit of that Opelousas, uh slang, I guess you could say from your from your childhood and and growing up just normal, normal normal childhood. I was a good student. You know, student athlete, loved to play basketball, um, loved to hunt with my dad. Awesome. And, um, yeah, tall guy. You're what, 6'3"? Six, 6'3". Three? Six, three. I was, uh, you know, 6'3 whenever I was 12, 13 years old. Oh, wow. Thought That's I was going to be seven boy. feet tall. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> just had my had my growth spurt early. Right. Yeah. All the basketball coaches were like, oh, yeah, you're playing basketball. Yeah, yeah just, just, just had a normal childhood. And, uh, you know, whenever – 
you know, I turned 15 years old. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school and, you know, starting to grow up and, you know, starting to want to experience different things. Right. Um, for, the, for the first time in that summer, I, I had a pretty quick burnout. Uh, got uh, started hanging around with different people, started using drugs, you know, yeah, started yeah. drinking more, uh, went, went, went pretty quick. And, uh, you know, yeah, uh, that's a pivotal time. Yeah. It, yeah, uh, sure. Hey, I was, I was, I was pretty hardcore. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, it, that's it's just it's a growth stage, and you know, I mean, your brain's not mentally fully developed, and everything's going crazy at that time in your life. I mean, hormones, uh, questions. You don't really, you know, uh, fitting in is a big thing at, at that point in everybody's life, and no, and, and, and you know, you certainly experiment with different things uh, that you really don't. Even, having a fucking clue right. of uh, uh, what could happen. So Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, everything's kind of rocking and rolling, but you kind of you start going down this path maybe uh, just at that point. Yeah, uh, July uh, of 1997, 15 years old, um, worst night of my life. Yeah. Um, out with friends earlier that night, um, <clears throat> the, the night – Ends uh, with with me killing a fourteen year old. Uh. Um, uh, that was the first and only time I ever did PCP in my life. Yeah, didn't abolition it. Didn't, uh, didn't know what I was putting in my body. Um, right. a, a, a brother of a friend of ours uh, gave gave us a joint laced yeah. with it. Um, I smoked it and um, just. Uh, what I can say is I've I've never felt the way that I've felt that night, yeah. and uh, never experienced the rage that I felt that I felt that night, yeah. and uh, I ended up taking someone's life. Um, it's a it's a crime that I'm uh, I continue to be remorseful and ashamed of. Um, uh, I and uh, I look back and I don't even recognize the person I was that night when I committed the crime. I take full responsibility for it. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm, I'm ashamed of, of the way it, it, it transpired. I, I recognize that, the, that, that I caused great harm, um, you know, uh, not only to Terry Pete and, um, and her family uh, and, and the community, uh, my family. And uh, as I often say, I, I threw, you know, I learned in prison to think of crime as uh, a rock hitting uh, a body of water and there's a ripple effect right. and the ripple affects so many people. And uh, I, what I did is I threw a boulder into a small pond right. and uh, that, that pond will never be the same. Yeah. Uh, wow. That's a, a uh, great analogy. You know, I, I, um, Andrew, I talk about it all the time and you know, we always say our hearts go out to the victims, families, et cetera. But you know what? That, and they do, but the, what most people don't realize, and I've had to deal with it over the years, is the offenders' families get destroyed also. And everybody who loves, everybody on both sides, you know. Uh, so I, I can tell you that, that I was arrested the, the evening after it happened. Um, cops, homicide detectives come right. to my house knocking on the door. Uh, and tell my parents, we need you to bring your son to the yeah. police station. And, you know, my parents are thinking, what does Andrew know about right. something someone else did? Uh, and I remember. Um, yeah, there was never a thought of, uh, you know, he, he did something. He it did was something. Uh, it was he knows somebody that did something. Basically. And, and, you know, I think initially my, you know, I'm going into the police station and I'm telling myself, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. And then I have this moment where I tell myself, I'm going to tell them what happened. And I, yeah. I ask, we get into the room where the interrogation is going to be. And I, I tell the cops, please have my mom leave the room oh, yeah. because I didn't want my mom to hear what I was well, about to right. say. And I feel, feel horrible. I put all that pressure yeah. on my, my dad who didn't know what I was about to say. Right. And then um, after I confessed, it was my dad's job then to leave the room and tell my mom who oh, was angry yeah. because why the heck? Did her son tell her to leave the room? Yeah. And then all of a sudden my dad has to go tell her that, you know, Andrew's killed someone and, yeah. and he's arrested for murder. Wow. That's, yeah. So just what you were talking about there, Woody, right. it's, there's victims on both sides of that 
of that spectrum and and you came from a, a good family you i mean didn't well, sound like I was, I'm the, anything abnormal no i i can't say that i'm the first person in my family to uh, graduate college but i am the first person in my f- family to go to the penitentiary yeah <laughs> well there you go <laughs> definitely and and so you're 15 and um that's uh, you know and wrap your mind around that, that time, first of all folks jeez for that time uh it really I don't know what the numbers are because I, I was detective at that time, but I'm thinking that um, well, I was in law enforcement at the time. I can't really think of many people that we charged at 15 yeah, or sent them to the, to the big house, right? And then most of them went to, you know, got they were charged as juveniles. Juvenile life. And, uh, yeah. was, was there a time where they were debating should we charge them as a juvenile or an adult? Uh, that, Sort of thing. You know, my recollection is there was about a week that passed. Uh, the the district attorney, and this was in Acadia Parish, right. um, um, you know, brought it to a grand jury, and a grand jury chose to indict me as an adult for second degree murder. Yeah, yeah. and then wow. I, I'm sure that is. I hate to say that in this case, but I'm sure was, we, we call an ape and an acute, acute political emergency also because of the outrage. Um, in the community of the crime, and and, and but I mean, that's certainly worth mentioning. I mean, they they had to feel so strongly about it. Um, it's not like you were running frequent flyer thug with them, right? And then you just mess, you messed up, and then they just they really threw the book at you. Yeah, and it, you know I think it's important to mention. Uh, the difference between a 15 year old mind and a, oh, yeah. and a 25 year old yeah, yeah, mind. Yeah, even though you were 6'3, your brain wasn't fully developed. No, and you, you actually have something. It's called a prefrontal cortex. And uh, that's basically for you listeners out there, it's the area that's located in the front of your brain. Uh, and science proves that this does not mature until the age of 25. Now, that prefrontal cortex. Uh, is responsible for kind of your your planning aspect of your brain and your executive functioning. So basically what it means is your understanding of consequences is not that as mature as a 25-year-old's would be with that prefrontal frontal cortex. So while you know right from wrong uh, and you understand right from wrong, at 15, and, and all of us can think back to 15, most people don't grasp this consequence is going to dictate the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah but you got it. Life seems like forever then. Right, right. But you got to add into that PCP. Oh, which yeah. is the worst shit ever made. And, and Never uh, done I've it? Dealt, but, no, I've dealt with it. But I've right. heard stories that made me not want to do that. On it that it, and you were right. You said you didn't recognize who, who you were that night. Uh, uh, I mean... I've dealt with people who were on it, and then when they were off it, right? Totally, totally different people. Yeah, and uh, it, uh, made, it's not an excuse. You made your decision, and and um, she's no longer on the planet, but you are owning up to it. it that's right. And um, I would ask you. You mentioned rage, and so were you. And you mentioned you didn't recognize that. That wasn't a part of your personality per se. And so I would imagine before this took place. Pretty laid back guy, probably. Yeah, sounds like. It wasn't a guy that gotten you know a lot of fights. Uh, you know, well at six may, three, many may, people didn't mess with well, you. Like, like <laughs> may throw may throw elbows on a basketball court, right. but there's a referee there to, you know. So no, I, I was a you know I was a chill guy. I, I was a friendly guy, and certainly, you know, wasn't exposed to violence at my home or in yeah. school. So th- this was you know the first time I'd I'd even. I had struck somebody. Yeah, in in my life. Yeah, wow. Well, the so did you go to trial or or went to trial? That, was was because uh, well, I would assume I'm gonna interrupt you that uh, they could come back and now they're going to do you as an adult at 15. Right. Then you've got nothing to lose, even though you That's, confessed. That, um, no lord, no defense attorney is going to plead their client to life in prison. That's right. Uh, and, and, you know, continue to be immature. And, and, you know, there's, 
you know, the, the, this youthfulness and, and, you know, having an attorney, which, you know, looking back, not, not tra- trashing him. I, I, I had to be held responsible for my actions, but, you know, I'm, then I'm, I, you know, awaiting trial. I'm, I'm a teenager who's scared to go to prison. Right. You know, how, how do I beat the criminal justice right, system? Right. How can I get off on trial? I was ultimately convicted uh, of a jury and, and sentenced to the one sentence that Louisiana can give for second degree murder. Right. And that's mandatory life, life, mandatory life without parole. That's right. And, and so we're going to get into that more later on, but I always say it's a, a lot of other states is life doesn't mean life. That's right. Great. After 20 years, 30 years, whatever they get a shot at parole, Louisiana, second degree, that's it. And, and so, and, um, is Louisiana unique in that or is yes, no, Louisiana really? is an outlier. Uh, is the the only state, and and the the frequency in which uh, we we hand out the sentence certainly makes us an outlier. You know, other states, even in other southern states, judges have a discretion on you know can they give you a low end where you you have uh, you either have an out date or you have parole eligibility at some point, like Louisiana. a twenty five to life, and twenty five to life, thirty to life, yeah. forty to life. Louisiana, Louisiana. Uh, life means life. Life means wow. life, and uh, there's no leeway or, or, or discretion in the judge or anybody else sentencing. I mean, you get it, you get it. That's why hmm. you take it to trial because you know you're praying. Yeah. The, uh, the only other deal would be if, if they charge with first degree murder and the death penalty is on the table as an option, and they do that a lot of times just so they'll take the plea for life. Right? That's Correct. the only way you're going to plead to life. Uh, I can tell you when the judge sentenced me after I was convicted. Uh, you know, his words were, I'm sorry f- for what I have to do, but the state of Louisiana only gives me one sentence that I can give you. Yeah. Wow. Can it, let me ask you just a real hard question of when it, I mean, if you can remember, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, when the judge is sentencing you, what's going on in that young brain of yours? So <clears throat> I, I, I think part of what, saved me and saved my mental health was that I was a, a dumb young kid yeah. whose brain wasn't developed. Kind of living in the moment. And I had this, you know, youthful, naive mindset that, okay, they're saying life and they're saying life means life, but that can't be what it means. Right. You know, I, I, there's going to be some way I overcome this. Yeah. And what happens is after several years in prison, I mature, I, I find a way, I find a routine, I find purpose in my life while I was in prison. And by the time my brain matured and I recognized, wait a minute, everyone else here who, who was sentenced to life isn't going home. Whenever the light bulb finally went off that I'm likely going to die in prison, I had matured enough to the point where I could handle that. Whereas, yeah, you had acclimated. I had acclimated, whereas I think – as a, as, as a child, which I was still a child when I went to prison, uh, a, a child who, who can committed a, a monstrous, monstrous act, but still a child and still a, a child's yeah. brain. <clears throat> I, I, I didn't accept uh, and didn't quite comprehend what that life sentence would be. So I think if I, if I would have, um, you know, I, I would have gone to prison a totally different person. Yeah. And I think, you know, not, not jumping the gun, but why we actually see this bunk bucks conventional wisdom. People who go to prison, who who get in trouble at a young age, actually have a great propensity to change because they haven't finished developing. And I think that's what happened in in my case was I I didn't know what I was getting into, but once I started to develop, I I, I I, I attained this quality of life, attained skills that I didn't have. I, I rebuilt my you, life. You, you did your time. You didn't let your time be. No, no, right. I did my time. Right. right. Well, and, I, and I'll tell you one thing with what you just said. What, what, what I'm hearing from that is when you're young and you get sentenced to a sentence like that, you haven't necessarily lived enough life to realize what you just gave up. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and so if you're 27 and you right. do that and you've got two kids and a wife and you right. you know a job and that happens 
it's a totally different reaction in your mind. I'll tell you the guys that do the worst time are guys that have kids at home, yeah. guys that have a wife or a girlfriend because their mind is on the outside. Right, right. And the way to do time is Just to think about the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Don't think about the outside world. Think about the inside. It'll drive you crazy. It'll drive, the, so, I'm mate. telling you guys that guys that have – especially young children or older children that are having their own problems right. and they feel helpless. Right. Those are the guys that don't do good time. Those wow. are the guys yeah. that, that succumb to the environment. It's crazy. That's yeah, interesting as hell to me. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it uh, makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, because then you, you feel like you can't do for them. You can't protect them or, or you let them down or, or whatever. Crazy. Yeah. So, and so you get sentenced, you go to prison. I put a lot of people in prison. I've never put a, well, not a 15 year old for life. What, what is it like when you go in and you get inside? I, I mean, I'm sure you went to hunts or somewhere first and got, uh, you tell me, yeah. so what's it, what, what do you think? Especially, and I'm not being racist, you know, this is the fact, the, the ratio of, of, um, uh, racist or ethnicity, mm -hmm. right? And you go in as, as a young, white male holy shit i was scared to death uh you know the, you know watched enough tv to know what the you know what media portrays prison to be like right. heard enough about the louisiana prison system right. you know to know how dangerous of a place it was they, they actually st started me off that i remember the warden after i was sentenced the warden uh, and, and the sheriff coming in to, to talk to me and, and you know one thing i i, I have a really good attitude towards law enforcement because I like law enforcement didn't put me in prison. Right, law enforcement right. didn't. I did. They were doing their job and I had good interactions where, you know, I had a warden and a sheriff come in and like they were empathizing with right. me because they knew what I was about to get into. And they come in and say, look, tomorrow, you know, we're not supposed to say, right. but just want to let you know, we're going to be putting you in a transport vehicle tomorrow and moving you to a state prison. I said, okay, uh, where am I going? Uh, and they said, well, we're bringing you to a place in Homa. I said, okay. And uh, so I knew whenever the van left the parish prison, you know, after a little while, I know what direction Homa is in, right. and we're going north. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, after, you know, I, I'm scared to say anything, but then I asked the, the, the transportation officer, where are we? Where are we going? I thought we we're going to Homa. Yeah. He said, "No, Homer, oh, okay. and, <laughs> which is almost in Arkansas." Yeah. So I thought I was going south to the Bayou somewhere, and we're going to north. You know, going to I didn't even know there was a Homer, Louisiana, right. <laughs> and, and they say, "Yeah, there's a state prison, and it's a you know it's a four hour drive from my home." Right. Uh, get there, and I remember wow. the warden of the facility is waiting on me, and you know I remember he he, he gives me a speech. And, you know, he's, he's waiting on me because I'm, I'm this kid that's going into his prison. And he says, do you have any questions for me? And I said, yeah, should, should I look to start, you know, to fight as soon as someone messes with me? But remember, he says, man, if that's the attitude you have, you're going to get in fights. Right. Don't look for fights. Because, like, I was waiting to, like, just punch right. the first guy. Yeah. Because, like, the advice I'm getting right. from – these yeah. guys at the parish jail, who now I realize, like, none of these yeah, guys they're, really they're, did any time. Exactly. They <laughs> they're, don't know. With you. they're like telling me, man, you, you go find the biggest yeah. guy right. and you punch and him out. And, yeah. and you get the respect. So, yeah, I like I was, you know, worried about getting raped. Yeah. I, I yeah. was thinking I would have to fight to, to, to protect myself. And, you know, while they're uh, – what, what I can t be honest with you, what helped me first going in there – is immediately the other guys who were there that went in as children right. mm -hmm. yeah. immediately came to me and took me under their wings. And, you know, I, I can remember the, the first time I was thinking about getting a tattoo. I didn't have a tattoo when I went into prison. Right. Today I still don't have a tattoo, right. but I, I was about to get the first tattoo. And a guy who was a juvenile when he got his life sentence and had been there for five years – and he had tattoos all over his arms, on his neck. And he told me, man, don't get it because yeah. as soon as you get it, you're going to keep getting them. Right. And look, they look like crap. Yeah. And he says, the people are going to judge you. He's like, you have this image. Keep this image. Keep yeah. this this like golden image because that's what everyone looks at you and you know, thinks you're a square. Like yeah. keep that image. Right. And like that impacted me getting, you know, 
hell, this is a guy that's like me that I can look up to. And like, I get it. If I wouldn't have taken that advice, I, I probably would have changed my image and I would right. regret having these horrible prison tattoos today. Wow. And, uh, that's crazy. I, I re- and I, never got one. I never got one. I remember the first time that um, I got into conflict with a guy that I was scared of and then listening to other guys saying, I don't mess with that guy. He keeps he keeps iron buried on the yard. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, and then I had to ask, well, what does that mean? You know, he has <laughs> he has shanks out wow. on the yard. So I remember going to another juvenile lifer uh, who had been there for about 10, 15 years and thinking, you know, this is I've known this guy for a couple months. You know, he's he's a welder. And I go to him. I was like, hey, I need a piece of metal like to have in case. And I remember him telling me, and, you know, at no point had he ever shown any anger or aggression to me. Um, and, he, and he, like, pulls me in close, and he says, if you ever ask me anything like that again, like, you're dead to me. Yeah. He's like, if, he's like you, you're so stupid. People, if you get a, if you get a weapon, you're yeah, going to use a weapon, absolutely. And it's like the same thing. Wow. Where, like, I was like, okay, and that peer pressure, I didn't, you know, I looked up to these other guys that I— realized had the same lived experience I had and I didn't want to disappoint them. Yeah. And like early on, that's what kept me on, on the right track and having these, you know, big brothers, um, you know, it kind of, it kept me insulated where people really didn't mess with me. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. That's crazy. That's, Man. you know, and, and you did, you went in there, you had no idea what to expect. All you knew of was what you saw on TV, right. which is Hollywood a lot of times. Uh, but, um, Homer was, and how long were you in home? I was in Homer for my first few years. Yeah, mm-hmm. but before before I transferred down south. Um, yeah, you know that that. Just if I could make one more. Point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The uh, you know, the, as far as like the fear of being raped, which right, I think yeah. is like any man goes to prison, no matter yeah. how big of a guy he's he is. Right, he's scared of it because right. I've seen the biggest guy come in and you know prison jargon get turned out I've yeah it. i've seen it too i, I i'm ex correction <laughs> officer also and it's yeah. you know it's all psychological right. and uh you know i went in worried someone's gonna try to penetrate me right and i was there a few weeks and i was like you know no one's trying to rape me they're actually it's it's actually the opposite yeah right. they, they they would call me tenderoni it was like i was <laughs> they, they wanted me uh you know to, to have sex with them and not the other way around. Yeah. So I was like, and, and what I learned is, uh, you know, it, it, it's psychological. And, you know, um, if, if, if I was strong enough not to get involved in the prison games uh, and, you know, not to say that, you know, people aren't, that there's, there is violence in prison. There continues to be violence today, violence today. Although, you know, whenever I first went in 20 something years ago, it, it still was a you know it was a more dangerous place right. than it is today, but there um, what I learned early on: mind your business, uh, don't get caught up in you know, stay away from you know they tell you uh, you know stay away from another guy's old lady in prison. Yeah. Yeah. You know don't yeah. don't get involved right. in you know inner relationships if 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 that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't get involved in gambling. Don't get involved. Right. You know, mind your business and and no and you know mostly that's true. And yeah. like I carried myself, um, you know, in a way that I think people uh, didn't want to weren't looking for reasons to mess with me. Yeah, and you in in from a uh, I guess you say an administrative standpoint in prison, you probably kind of stood out uh, versus your typical what you would think of as convict, right? I mean, you're, you're, uh, even though you were young when you went in, um, you're edu- you speak with an education, right? I, I knew my, you know, I was the first job I had was, you know, wipe it, cleaning up uh, as a, as a juvenile, they had me segregated in a unit. I actually at this prison in Homer, which is David Wade correctional mm-hmm. center. It's, uh, you know, most police officers, corrections right. officers, High profile people right. who get sent to DOC get sent to this unit in, in, at David Wade. And so that's where they sent me. And it's actually the worst time I ever did. You think it's like a 50 man unit, all alpha personalities. Right. And this kid shows up, and everyone 
you know, has has advice for the kid that shows up. So it was really, it, it was it was the 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 other juvenile lifers I were I was around were really good influences. The you know not so much some of the other people. But the first job they gave me was at night because I they didn't want me around the rest of the population. Um, they had me going in the kitchen at night and cleaning tables, and mopping, um, and and after I did that for several months, I had a lieutenant. Uh, came by and is actually a, a, a black man. Um, and as, as you said, you know, most people in prison are black. And I was an outlier here. And I was one, a white kid, but didn't look even like the other white guys that right, were there. Right. So um, <clears throat> this lieutenant sees me, and I think he just saw something in me. And one night he stops me and says, do you know how to type? I said, yeah, I know how to type. He says, I got a job for you. He says, can you, if you can keep your mouth shut. I said, I can keep my <laughs> mouth shut. So he got me a job as the clerk for the, the night shift security office. Wow. And so what I was doing was I was typing use of force reports, typing disciplinary reports, just ty- uh, typing occurrence reports for security that worked at night. And so that was just this one officer that saw something in me and wanted to give me a chance really affected me because it, um, you know, I, working around security, which is usually like a taboo thing. Right. You know, you don't work right. for the man. If you work for the man, you're a rat. Right. Right. I think people gave me leeway because they saw me as a kid that really didn't know a lot about it. But I learned from like sort of a security perspective, how they think, yeah. how they see everyone. And it helped me for the rest of my incarceration where I understood like, hey, if I'm dealing with a free man, I, I know better how they think. I know how the know what their processes are so i was just really lucky early on having these privileges not just the way i looked but opportunities that educated me about prison life very 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 god used so many different people man uh uh, the best sides even even like the welder you said you know like hey dude yeah you'd be dead to me if you ever Mm -hmm. asked that again and the co uh just made a a little piece of jesus and said hey Give this kid a shot, right? And then you're able to take that because at some point, you, you, I, I would assume after you're probably after you're 21, they ship you. Yep. And, and so you're better prepared for where you go next, which is Dixon Correctional. That's yeah. where I worked at. DC. I, I, I mean, of course, I trained at Angola, yeah. but now at Burl Kane was actually my warden. Yeah. And then, uh, so I ran the first rec room A and then I got a, a matter yeah. they, then they Burl Kane sent me to work in cell block so mm-hmm. I had two tiers of work WCB and then two tiers of admin say so now you're you're headed there and and what's the thought process of you well it's a it's a new place you know I asked to be closer to home right um and still at that point trying to avoid Angola yeah but uh I, I end up uh at, at Dixon Correctional Institute and uh, you know I'm, I'm there you know, for several years, um, I, I, this is a point now I'm in my, you know, early twenties. Um, and you know, I, I'm maturing. I still have, you know, the, the, the immaturity that any 20 year old has, Sure, but, um, but, but growing up, understanding more got, you know, got, got there and there were a lot of programs, got involved mm-hmm. in Toastmasters, got involved right. in the boxing Program, yeah. Ended up, we, we just, we just did an episode on Entian. Entian, the black crime. I had it on my cell block on on the WCB but yeah. with a white guy from the, the LP that was a celly. So yeah. I realized I wasn't a boxer, but what I was really good at was uh, it was sort of managing the team. Right. And then there's an association, a prison boxing association. Right. So we would travel, and then I ended up getting the response. You know, we'd weigh guys in, we'd match them up. And, uh, I just it, people it, it, don't understand how big the boxing program it's, is. It's yeah. huge, and and there are guys out today. You know, some of the guys have gotten out and not had the stardom that ATN had, yeah. but but yeah. were able to box. But it oh, just I, it gave um, so many guys, um, you know, a, a different perspective and character from Plaquemine. It was on the contender. Uh, oh, uh, I mean, he did, he did. Well, I mean, he was down. Actually, I, I think he was a, a also a good goal. boxer. Yeah, he was. A, he was a great boxer. Great Not boxer. Hassan Henderson. Or no, no, no. It's a, um, oh man, I, I can't think of it. From Plaquemine. But anyway, he fought on the contender, and and I, I don't think he's fought in the last couple of years. But he he was 
Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson. Uh, Baby, uh, Baby uh, Face Assassin. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And so, so many of those guys that were successful, actually, they were juveniles when they went in. Right. Actually, he was a juvenile. So, Eric, yeah. so Baby Face and I started at Wade together. He was really? Actually, oh, come on. Really? At Wade, and he came to DCI before me. I followed him. And, uh, you know, they got to, at DCI, they have a youthful offender program. 15, 16 year olds, not lifers, but. Um, and, and they had a warden there, Larry Eichard, mm-hmm. assistant warden that was over the boxing team. And he was so smart, he'd go get these kids out the program and start training them. Right. They were really raw, but they would listen to the trainers because right. yeah. they were kids. And they give them something to focus on besides the bullshit that's going on, right? So, so those guys, even the ones that come home, Eric, you know, they may not be boxing today, but you know that gave them that gave them uh, you know a pathway, something to do, right. some positive energy, right. gave them discipline, hope. Yeah, yeah. And 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 before we go any farther, I want to mention this because you can certainly speak to it. Um, but Woody has mentioned this several times, as well as uh, Kelly Jennings, who has her own podcast, but is a guest of ours frequently. Um, and that is the most important thing from an administrative standpoint to give to any prisoner, any convict is hope, because without that. You have no control. Well, it speaks to what he said earlier about the, the older people coming in with the families and the kids and stuff like that. They're focusing on the outside. They're not focusing on anything positive. There's no hope. Maybe yeah. They're thinking. Well, and one unique thing you did when you went to D, uh, DNC, when you went to uh, DCI. DCI, was you started getting involved in a lot of programs. And you mentioned Toastmasters. What so, is that Toast, for those? Toast, that, so we say it's a, a, a leadership and communication organization. It's a public, it helps you with public speaking. Awesome. So, so there are people who, um, who are terrified of speaking that get in it and learn how to speak. And then there are people like me who think that they're better speakers. Than they <laughs> <laughs> and I can helps, relate. And it helps us, <laughs> helps us ref, like refine our skill, not say as many us or right. try to, try to uh, d- disguise our accent sometimes. Yeah. But, but it get, you know, just gave me an avenue to focus on. And like all this time I'm taking college courses. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm improving my education. I'm, uh, I started working for the warden. Right. Uh, and that gave me an opportunity. Um, you know, I, I say that what I practice today is servant leadership. Yeah. And, and I always try to think of my, my role as a leader as, as how can I help others, not how society can serve me, but how, right. how I can serve others. And where I, I sort of developed that, I think I, I had that personality when I was a kid, but working for the warden, everyone always you know needs help yeah, in right, prison. Right, and right. you were someone that could go, a conduit. you can do like, hey, I don't get involved in it, or you can be a conduit. Right. Or you can be the, the shady guy who... Who does yeah. favors and ends up getting in trouble right. and gets booted out? But it's I was, swung. I was the conduit, and I, I would help people, and I just, I would help other young guys coming in. I would help old timers, and it's just sort of something I, I was good at. The administration trusted me when I brought something that I, I wasn't trying to help someone. Um, they, they, you brought some stuff that was legit. That wasn't personal right. gain right, for right. me. So I think the long story short was that's sort of where I developed. This ad, this the skill for what I do today in in you know how how can I use whatever influence I have to to benefit people who who need help. Yeah, and cool. it's a it's a unique experience. Um, and I would even add to that that uh, at that time in your in your life, it was the education aspect uh, not only that helped pass. Let's face it, pass the time. But also uh, gave you hope that even though you were sentenced to life with no parole, I don't know if at this point it had clicked yet or uh, uh, if you were one of these people that always had that positive attitude that, hey, I'm going to appeal this or appeal that or something's going to change. I didn't I didn't do there's when you get a life sentence, there's one mandatory appeal and, you know, it happened and. After it happened, I never filed another appeal. Wow. Just really early on. And I, I look back and I was like, man, I was I, I did wise things. I don't know how wise I was then, but I, I made a lot of good decisions because if I would have got caught up with appeal, 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 don't take responsibility. Because if you take responsibility, then mm-hmm. you, you may not have a shot for a court to 
And I, I just was like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my time and I'm going to figure, you know, I'm not going to worry about the BS and you control know, by, what you can control. Well, by that time, I really just wanted to say like, Hey, I don't want to be after being in prison for a really short time, like a couple months, you know, I saw a big difference between the guys that, you know, just were, were cynical and like the system messed over me right. and I didn't it do it. Bad, right? It got me bad. Yeah. And the guys that were like, man, you know, I, I did what I did and I'm taking my lick. Um, yeah, right. like those guys just seemed so peaceful. So I was like, oh, I want to be one of those guys. You know, see, they the, the if the, you're focusing all your energy on the pills and and you know they got me bad and all that, then you wouldn't have the energy to put into all you know the boxing program or working with the warden or you know the public speaking. You know, it, it, if you college you, courses, yeah, 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 educating yeah. myself. Like, like yeah, those, didn't you get like 40 hours there or something? Yeah, or? I earned, I ended up earning actually more than that, but I earned, like I was able to eventually transfer 40 hours whenever right, I, right. I left prison. Right. Well, so yeah, it could have been, which is a heck of a start. Yeah. Which yeah. is a heck of a yeah. start. I couldn't earn, I, I wasn't able to earn a degree, but thankfully, you know, all those Englishes and maths, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. all the stuff you don't want to take, biology want to take, get them while you're down, right? Yeah, you say, you get, they had a captive, uh, audience. So those, you, you know, the guys that are stuck in the law library, like, you know, and look power to them because there are innocent people in prison yeah, yeah, I get and that. I, and I, and I get it, but like that, that's, that becomes a full-time job and an obsession. And right. those guys that go down that rabbit hole, they, they stay down that yeah. rabbit hole. Yeah. So you, you, uh, in DCI and you're, you know, you're doing the right things. You're getting involved in. But one thing is you, when you're at, you know, uh, what guys in prison would call satellite camps, they're state prisons. Yeah. And, you know, they don't really make lifers trustees, especially yeah. young lifer, right, right. you know, because, really? Okay. Yeah. So the, to be a trustee at Angola is t- a totally t- different criteria than being a trustee everywhere else. Right. Yeah. Angola so, is 10 years before you get considered, right? Right. But everywhere else, it's regard. If you're a lifer, they're not making trustees at DCI at Hunt. They're not making you a trustee based really on what your behavior is or how you know. It's based on how much time you have left right. because the thought process is short termers have less chance or aren't going to escape. Right. Yeah. Long termers are going to escape. At Angola, everyone's a long termer. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah. true. So, <laughs> that, so the outlook. So going to Angola was an opportunity to become a trustee and, you know, after being, you know, at a couple of prisons, but, you know, wanting to, okay, I want to feel like, you know, I'm free and everyone knows like, Hey, by that time, I'm not scared of that. You know, I've done enough time where I've like, Hey, I can go somewhere and I can, you know, even to the bloodiest prison in America, I can go and figure out how to, you know, to stay above the violence and to be, you know, uh, be involved in positive things. So I knew going to Angola would give me the opportunity to be a trustee. Now, right. before you went to Angola, wasn't there a point where you worked for the Louisiana State Police Headquarters? Yes. So before okay. that's, I was at State Police Headquarters uh, uh, for a few years. I actually worked at the Jazz Tech facility. Yeah, that's the training. <clears throat> I retired from State Police. Yeah. So I, I worked at Jazz Tech. Uh, worked for the administration. Did you, did you stay at the barracks at, at the Jazz barracks. Tech? Yeah, I stayed yeah, at the barracks. Yeah. Um, this is a great yeah. story, by the got, way. <laughs> yeah, got the uh, got my only write up that I really? had in my entire incarceration uh, at the barracks. And it was an unauthorized female visitor. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, tell me about this one. I got to hear this. If yeah. anything's worth a write-up, that yeah, is. Yeah, I'm going to sing. Is that a high court? Uh, yeah, that's a high court yeah. write-up. It's a it's a uh, rule, rule 30, and I forget the, the initial. But right. the, the rule is no unauthorized female visitors on the premises, and people, you know, may say, oh, oh, can you get a, yeah, but I at the I, at the office where I worked, there was a there was a female visitor, so I had to, you know, I had to, uh, you know, I was told, hey, you you you, you can't stay here, you, right. you you can't stay here. So at, at that point, I knew well after having done, um, you know, been in the satellite pr- pl- uh, places, but I can't be a trustee. Uh, Just Tech is a state police training facility, but actually. They make a whole. They have like a hotel out there and stuff, and they um, where they hmm. get all the federal employees to come in and train on everything from the um, postmasters to whatever. They have the high speed driving track, and I mean it's it's a 
it's a really impressive thing, but they make a lot of their money off the um, these corporations and the feds, you know, pay so much for this. It's a world class training facility. Yeah. But in it's a I don't know how big the compound. I guess you would call it a compound, but inside that is a uh, mini prison, a satellite camp is what is what it's called. You know, mm. it, it tell so us about that. It's a dormitory. You imagine a, it's two dorms in one big building. Um, if you imagine army barracks, you right, know, kind of right. keep that in mind. And it's actually cubicles. Uh, so the, uh, these are state prisoners uh, who are working for state police. Uh, yeah. Some of them are, you know, a lot of them are mechanics, body right, shop guys. Right, right. Doing they do all everything. On Every, the, yeah. it's, it's, it gives the state savings because, sure. and, you know, you, you have uh, – of convicts work, working on vehicles. Yeah, you're not going to Jiffy Lube. You're you're going to Jiffy Lube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guys that uh, do the, the 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 grass maintenance at the yeah. state police headquarters. Right, that's uh, where I was. The yeah. electricians, you know. They have well, even the, even the wow. automotive guys at state police headquarters used to service my units. Yeah. The, uh, um, it, was, it was convicts. Okay. Yeah. And the guys who work at the governor's mansion. Right. That's, live yeah. at the state police barracks. You right. got a, a, a guy who works at the airport. Uh, right. For for you know taking care of state police's yeah. helicopter, and then I worked for the 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 commander, which was the equivalent of the warden, uh, you know doing administrative stuff, still doing what I'm good at, helping other Cor- guys. Yeah. Corey Holmes, uh, his daddy's been out there for like 39 years, and I can't think of his daddy's first name because I'm John bad. John Holmes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, sorry, Chris. The, 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 so I think there. Corey's a twin, mm-hmm. and then their dad's been out there for like thirty nine years. I, I can see his face right now, but I'm bad with names. But what what did you, did you know him? What, yes. what what did he do? He's a uh, he's a lieutenant. He's a supervisor right, right, out right. there at the barracks. Oh, that's right. Say it. I yeah. thought it at the house. Yeah. So that's and and how did those you know? So in my mind, uh, obviously, I don't have your experience. I don't have Woody's experience. So. Um, I have the the general listener's experience, so I'd I'd ask this question, which is, okay, you've got police and convicts, and they're working side by side. How was that relationship? Was it like a normal type thing that you would have with anybody you worked with, or was it? You I mean, know, I'm so, sure you had your assholes just like anywhere. Yeah, else. no, surprisingly, a lot of res- you know, there's a lot of respect. On, on both sides. One, it's a zero right. tolerance place, obviously. Yeah. So if you know. If you screw up, that you're going to be gone. Swing, yeah. But uh, you know, troopers are pretty professional, and yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you don't have to. And I always said this: the whatever you're in for, your job, even as a correctional officer, is not to punish them for what their uh, crime they did on the outside, right? It, it's it's to uh, keep society safe, or you know, keep them from escaping and, and doing whatever. You're not there to punish them. And to me, and I know I wasn't doing the kind of time y'all were doing, especially when I was a CO. I mean, but you're there 12 hours a night and, and a lot of times, 30 times a month because of a shorthand. But I developed a relationship. You're not supposed to, but the as long as they gave me respect, I gave them respect. Yeah. And and I actually, I, mean, I, I, mean, I say this today, I die. A lot of the, the convicts, and there's a difference between convict and enemy, a lot of the convicts, were better than some of the free people I worked with. What's the difference between convict and inmate? An inmate's a young buck that's doing all the trouble, doing the fights, the drugs, the the, the rapes and stuff like you could tell. Yeah, like, convicts the guy convicts down doing their time. Convicts doing time. Right. Yeah. Uh, and 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 convicts set he he understands uh you know how to do his time. He understands how not to get involved in the BS. Yeah, they don't want anything to interrupt the routine, the, uh, or you can take away the privileges, right? Right. So, if you, yeah, it's all about you. You know, most guys who've been at Angola for a long time, they've been on the same job for a long time because right. it's all about routine. It's all, you, he's probably been working for the same free man for a long time. Right. They have respect. You know, you don't, you don't want change. Right. You want to know every morning – when you wake up, because when guys first went to Angola, they don't know what's going to happen. Right. You yeah. know, there's turmoil. They want that peace of mind. And uh, so, you know, that's what most of your convicts are trustees because right. they yeah. figured out how to get the be- best quality of life possible, even while they're doing a life sentence. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's what I told you before. Like, um, if you get a young CEO or whatever goes down in, you know, search is a part of, uh, of, 
prison life, right? But there's a different way you do it. If you're going in a foot locker and you're dumping out all their shit and disrespecting their shit, they're probably going to buck up. But it, it, you know, if you do it, you got to do your job. If you do it respectfully, but you just still do your job, then you get that respect back. Absolutely. It's all about respect. Love that. And um, I think I think what we can do. So Andrews, uh, at the, we're at the point of the story where he's he's going in Angola, right? And uh, and, and when I told, uh, like I told Andrew ahead of time, I said I just want to get in there and get behind the microphone because you never know what's going to come out. Yeah. And this episode has been absolute fire, and Andrew has agreed. To do a second episode, right? To stay with us <laughs> on the spot, y'all. You we put got, the pressure. You on. haven't heard anything yet. I, I got guy bumps right now talking about it. Yeah, we haven't you even got, got into the amazing hear part. What's coming <clears throat> next? So, um, it's fire. Yep. It's, it's it's it is a. We, we hope it will open your hearts and minds to um, the work that's being done. In, in the goodness is coming out of, of horrible tragedies. That's right. And so stay tuned for part two. Part two? I got a name for it. Yeah, what do we? I don't, what what you do you want, think man? you're going to name it, Andrew? Well, you know, our tagline at Parole Project is believe in second chances. All right. We're going to call like it that. second chances. Yeah, second chances. So, y'all, we're going to name this episode second chances in. Stay tuned for part two of Second Chances. And until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. And oh, I want to say thank you, Andrew. Yes, thank you, Andrew. And Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you for staying there for the <laughs> next one, which we're doing right now. But uh, you're Jim Chapman, and I'm Woody Overton. Your host of Bloody and Go Up, a podcast 142 years in the making. The complete story of America's bloodiest prisons. Peace. <laughs>